Hi there, friend. Welcome to this bonus podcast. I have entitled this episode, What Most People Don't Know About Bible Translations. I will be discussing the two main types of Bible translations I recommend for most people. As a Bible translator since 1983, I feel that most Christians in the USA are not given enough information about why Bible translations differ in wording and which kinds of Bible translations will be better for different kinds of readers. This is an important topic, so I'm actually surprised at myself. I am bummed out. I can't believe that I haven't released a dedicated podcast about this topic every year since 2014. Also, please stay tuned for the end of this podcast because I want to recommend a fantastic new real book Bible. Because of more difficult content in this podcast, if you are not driving a car, it would be a great idea to open the podcast notes so you can visually follow along and make sure you don't miss something important. Look especially at the words or sentences I have made bold. There are actually five types of Bible translations, but in this podcast I will mainly be discussing the two most used types. But let's start with showing you the two types with a translation example that is not from the Bible. And here is our sentence Jill looked like a deer caught in the headlights when she heard Jack's proposal. Jill looked like a deer caught in the headlights when she heard Jack's proposal. Now imagine a word-for-word translation for some language in Africa. Since we don't know a language like that, let's pretend we do and make a word-for-word translation into English. Here's my suggestion for that. Jill appeared like a trapped gazelle in bright light upon hearing Jack's desire. What we have in this example, caught in the headlights, is a figure of speech. Americans rather frequently use this figure of speech, but a word-for-word translation for the hypothetical African audience would very likely be tricky for them to understand. They might not know what a gazelle would do if a bright light shone upon them. For that matter, I don't know if gazelles act like deer when meeting with bright lights. I think a person from our hypothetical African audience might understand Jill appeared like a gazelle trapped in bright light to be a gazelle trapped with a metal trap in pain and struggling to get loose when the bright light suddenly shines upon it. Our hypothetical African listener will probably get a very different idea about what is meant. For our second hypothetical translation, let's try giving the plain meaning like we would if we were explaining to an eight-year-old child. We might translate, Jill was stunned by Jack's proposal. Or we might say, Jill was caught off guard and totally surprised by Jack's offer. For this example translation, I've dropped the figure of speech entirely and gone straight for the meaning. These are the two main translation types that I want to explain. The first was what we call a literal translation or a word-for-word translation, and the second is what I call a meaning-based translation. The literal Jill appeared like a trapped gazelle in bright light. The meaning-based, Jill was stunned by Jack's proposal. Which translation is right? Well, actually, both translations can be considered right. But the word-for-word translation is difficult to understand for our hypothetical African listeners, because there are cultural factors in interpreting the figure of speech in this example. The listeners would likely come up with various interpretations about the poor, defenseless gazelle being trapped. Whereas, in the case of Jill looks like a deer caught in the headlights, if Jill likes Jack, 
She may be thrilled at his proposal. The meaning-based translation is right, too. Jill was stunned by Jack's proposal. That translation is easy to understand, but if you remember the original sentence, you'll miss the richness of the figure of speech. The two main Bible translations have exactly the same problems as what I've shown in the two examples above. The advantage of a literal word-for-word -word translation is that it mirrors the form of the original text. The disadvantage of a literal translation is that it cannot always clearly give the meaning in the target language. The meaning-based translation has just the opposite picture in the plus and minus category. The advantage of the meaning-based translation is that it shows the meaning clearly. The disadvantage of a meaning-based translation is that it cannot mirror the form of the original text. Every Bible translator starts out thinking, I will be so clever that I will be able to translate word for word and still clearly enough show the meaning. For two languages that are strongly related to each other, a literal translation can often still be clear. But if we're thinking of translating ancient Hebrew and Greek into modern English, there's a huge gulf between the ancient and modern languages and cultures. You cannot translate literally and still keep the meaning clear. My first example involved an English figure of speech, but let me give you a chance to experience decoding an Indonesian figure of speech. Jakobus Adela Kacang Yang Suda Lupa Kulitnya, or a word-for-word -word translation is this, Jack is a peanut that has forgotten his shell. Jakobus Adela Kacang Yang Suda Lupa Kulitnya. Now it's your turn to wonder what that could mean. You won't guess, so I will tell you. Here's the meaning-based translation of Jack is a peanut that has forgotten his shell. That means Jack left his rural village to get an education in the city and now has a good job with a high salary, but he has forgotten his humble beginnings. He never helps any of his friends and relatives back in his home village. There are many literal or word-for-word -word Bible translations in English. That kind of translation is easier to make. And not all literal translations are equally literal. Some fudge to be slightly more meaning-based. But for the purpose of this discussion, I will choose what I think is the most popular literal translation today. It is the ESV, English Standard Version. It is the one that would translate, if it were in the Bible, Jill appeared like a trapped gazelle in bright light. It is great at showing the word-for-word -word form of the original text, but not so good at giving you the meaning clearly. A literal translation I like better than the ESV is the Web BE, World English Bible British Edition. Meaning-based Bible translations are much rarer because they require the translator to work much harder to accurately translate the meaning. For English language readers, in chronological order, I recommend the Weymouth New Testament in Modern Speech of 1901. Even though it's that old, you'll find that it's still surprisingly modern. And then the second is the Good News Bible, also called TEV Today's English Version of 1966. And the most modern is the New Living Translation. There are a few more, but those are my favorites, and I will focus in this podcast on the NLT. The NLT would translate our example as, Jill was stunned by Jack's proposal. The King James Version is a literal translation, 
and an unfortunate part of the continuing legacy of the King James Version is that pastors often prefer using literal translations from the pulpit. But unfortunately, this means that many Christians who open their Bibles on days other than Sunday often struggle with hard-to-understand passages. If you normally read the ESV Bible and think you understand everything in it, well, I bet you haven't read all of it. Here is one of my most important recommendations for you. Make sure you have access to both kinds of translations. In other words, use both the ESV and an NLT Bible. That way you can quickly see the meaning in the NLT and you get a window into the word-for-word shape of the original text with the ESV. My daily Bible reading podcasts have only used the two meaning-based translations most commonly seen today, NLT and GNT. Why? Because they can be understood by people just listening to the recordings. It would be useless to record the ESV because listeners would often miss the meaning. Now I want to illustrate what I've been saying with a Bible passage. I wish I could spend an hour doing this at least, but I feel I must limit myself to only one example. I've chosen the topic statement for the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The ESV, verse 16, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. If I had all you podcast listeners in front of me as a group, I would say to you, raise your hand if you're a Jew. Usually in my audiences, no one raises their hand at that. And at that point, I follow up and say, raise your hand if you're a Greek. Usually, again, no one raises their hand. But then my question is, well, where do you fit in Romans 1, verse 16? This verse says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Sounds like you people who didn't raise your hands are not able to be saved. So which one are we? The answer is that Paul is contrasting Jews with everyone else. Greek was the universal language of culture and commerce at that time, even under the Roman government. Now let's compare the same verse in the NLT. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first, and also the Gentile, or even better, I think, and also the non-Jews. Now let's look at verse 17 in the ESV. For in it, referring back to the gospel, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. No English reader will suspect that there is anything kind of strange about the phrase, the righteousness of God. The problem is that of God is a genitive in Greek. That's a grammatical category, and genitives have a dozen different options for the meaning. The ESV nearly always uses the word of to translate genitives. That's only one of the meanings. But in this verse, righteousness of God will mean that the gospel is about revealing that God is righteous. God possesses righteousness. But wait a minute. If God is righteous and I am not righteous, that's not good news. He will punish me for not being righteous. Rather, in this verse, 
The genitive is one showing source. Just wait a minute and I will read the NLT and you'll understand what I mean by that. A second significant problem in verse 17 is a grammatical construction that forms an idiom in Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That literal translation has almost zero meaning, or it leaves the reader to guess at meanings which will probably be wrong. Finally, because of the first two problems mentioned above, it seems like that final quote from Habakkuk 2.4 doesn't fit with what came before it. So we ask, why did Paul quote, the righteous shall live by faith? Now let me read verse 17 in the NLT. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Many years ago now, I had a phone conversation with a woman who was a new believer. She liked reading her King James Version, and I used Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 to try to show her that she would be better off reading the NLT. The King James Version has the same problem in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So I asked her what that means, and she quickly replied, Oh, you know, the Catholic faith, the Mormon faith, the Protestant faith. Oh, hello. None of those things existed when Paul wrote Romans. I give that story to show that a dangerous thing happens when many people read the Bible. If we don't understand something... We may just make up a meaning that sounds plausible to us. And as time goes on, we can get more and more convinced that our guesses are true. Going back to the advantages and disadvantages of the two translation types, the ESV has made a very good literal translation of verse 17. The ESV closely mirrors the form of the Greek text, but the problem is that readers won't grasp the meaning unless perhaps there are study notes to guide them. On the other hand, the NLT has the disadvantage that it doesn't match the word-for-word -word form of the Greek, but it nails the meaning. God is the source of our righteousness. NLT translates, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. And the Greek idiom, from faith to faith, means this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. Finally, if you take the time to read verse 17 again, you will see that the quote at the end of the verse supports what Paul is claiming about the good news. I'm passionate about people having access to at least one Bible that is a literal translation and one that is a meaning-based translation. Recently, an elder in our church shared with me that he was struggling hard to read and understand Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. He was rather bitter in his complaints, saying, Why did Jeremiah write a whole chapter like this? I can't penetrate this stuff. This is just one example of many I could share. Normal Christians like you and me who try to use a literal translation for devotional readings and attempt to read every book in the Bible will not enjoy the experience, at least in some of the books. The long-term results of what it's like to have only one literal translation can be seen in Indonesia.
where the people have had their one main literal translation since 1974. Indonesian Christians have been discouraged from reading their Bibles for too long. And that has seriously weakened the church throughout that country. Now, with our plain Indonesian translation, thousands of people have discovered that they enjoy reading the Bible. With our 90-day New Testament reading challenge, Teenage kids and adults are rejoicing to find that they enjoy reading the New Testament, finishing it in 90 days, three chapters per day, and many immediately start over to read it again. Any Christian who wants to glorify God should read the whole Bible. And if we really want to glorify God, then we should read a translation we understand. Reading a translation you don't understand fully will not help you or encourage you. I need to give two important clarifications. Some people think that the NLT is a paraphrase because the first edition still contained some words or phrases that sounded like the Living Bible. The Living Bible deserves to be called a paraphrase because it occasionally adds ideas not found in the original text or fails to translate other things. But the New Living Translation is a highly researched and revised meaning-based translation. My second clarification is that the message is an extreme paraphrase. Please don't think it is a faithful translation. Please don't quote it. Please don't give it to a new Christian to read. Here is the information about real book Bibles I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. I want you to know that no one at Tyndale House Publishers asked me to promote their products, and I'm not getting paid anything for giving out this information. Gail decided to give New Living Translation Bibles to members of her Bible study groups, and I decided to give some of them to my small group. It has been a long time since we bought Bibles, and so we made some delightful discoveries. Tyndale House has several new NLT Bible editions right now. The NLT Illustrated Study Bible is incredible beautifully illustrated with maps and charts and many study notes and supplemental information. The hardcover edition is only $37, rounding up a little bit. You might like the leather-like edition of this study Bible, which is a bit more expensive. However, at more than 2,500 pages, you won't want to carry this Bible around. Here's what I'm giving to some young people in our church, including our grandkids. There is a new kind of Bible developed by Tyndale House called a filament-enabled NLT Bible. This real book Bible comes without study notes and maps, making it practical to carry and providing an uncluttered reading experience but it has a companion cell phone app that gives you all the stuff you would get in a study Bible and much more. You download the Filament app for your phone or tablet, and then when you want to get more information about a passage that's on a particular page, you take a picture of the page number or you type in the page number. The app then gives you study notes charts, timelines, and devotional material, including videos and even worship songs. There is a premium value edition with a leather-like cover for just 15 bucks. For the person who wants to make notes, there's a beautiful wide-margin edition available for $38. A large-print filament-enabled Bible is about the same price, 
The genuine leather thin-line edition of the NLT Filament Bible is only $35. I highly recommend an article linked at the very end of today's episode notes entitled How Not to Argue About Which Bible Translation is Best by Andy Nacelli. And thank you so much for listening. May the Lord bless you real good.